clock restoration specialist, uh, uh, a horologist, uh, extensive training all over uh, in England and I think in France. France, France, France. France. right? So um, he's given uh, 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 three lectures here before, all of which have been really, really well done, and I'm sure you will enjoy this one. Yeah, we never lost them before. <laughs> <laughs> We're just looking I'm, at the, I'm putting an air tag on there. <laughs> <laughs> We're just looking at the clock tower, the city hall. So just you know, did a, uh, a perusal of the uh, the mechanism to see it's uh, it's quite the deplorable it's state of it. Yeah. Talking about a restoration of that. So anyway, let's get, let's get on with it here. So again, my apologies. Uh, so we're going to talk about John Harrison. We have like a half hour, so we'll speed it up a bit. Um, so the, the, the basic issue here, uh, everyone know who John Harrison was or no? No. A few people that do? Okay, it's so a problem where in the 18th century we have, we have ships, England has ships, France has ships, basically those two countries. And what's happening is as soon as you leave your port, you don't know where you are. You don't know how to get back. You, you have your latitude, but you don't know where the longitude is. You have your north and south, and not your east and west. So coming back, you think you're, you're going in, you know, you're, you're going to go into the, the channel and you end up hitting the rocks and you, you lose men, you lose uh, provisions and things like that. So then the king, this is going to be a brief and then I'm going to get, get into the talk. The king set up, said, look, I'll give you 20,000 pounds. It's the equivalent of $4 million today to any clockmaker that can, uh, <clears throat> any clockmaker that can fix longitude, that can find longitude. Uh, and the, the, so we need a way to do it. They, no one knew how to do it. So we had a lot of quacks, came forward, and we're going to talk about the man that solved the problem that built the first marine chronometer, and that solved the problem of longitude. So I got a lot of information here, so I'm reading it. Don't usually read, but we're going to have to read and talk a little bit to get through it. So, so John Harrison uh, was the Born and developed his early timekeepers in Barrow on the River Humber in England. It's one of the largest rivers, um, 1693 to 1776. Uh, Harrison's time, marine timekeepers and pendulum clocks solved the greatest scientific problem of the age, how to find longitude or longitude, as we put it, at sea. It is in these extraordinary machines that his real achievement lies. The story of how the timekeepers were made is also a great tale over triumph and adversity. In spite of much prejudice from his peers, many practical and technical difficulties also ensued. Harrison's work proved to be one of the major technological achievements of the 18th century. He was right at the top. One of the best known horologists or clockmakers um, to exist. And he came virtually untrained. We don't know where he got his training from. So this invention, truly an accurate portable timekeeper that solved the problem when it was solved, was not just the first practical marine chronometer, but also laid the foundation of all subsequent precision watches today. So it was basically the first type of watch you could carry anywhere. It was huge, but 13 centimeters, but it laid any watch we have today that moves around, thank John Harrison. His timekeepers were complex, but they did not strike the hours chime on the quarters, or even play. Uh, they did nothing, they didn't even have an alarm to wake you. So it was no frills. This was just something to, something to tell, tell time, that was it. And the issue was that you can't take a clock on a boat that's rocking, rocking in three, three dimensions, three axes. And when it does that, you know, your pendulum stops, it loses time, etc. So we're talking about seconds. Seconds could result in missing by miles, and miles could mean the rocks over there. So in, in addition, these mechanisms that Harrison made did not have complicated calendar indications, uh, automation mechanisms, astronomical indications to amuse anyone, or even oppress or an educate. So being wholly, wholly self-taught and working almost entirely alone, his horological thinking was deeply unconventional. He was a carpenter. He was a pioneer in his field, and it could be said that he was basically the first government-sponsored research and development project, even though the, quote, government that's putting up the prize gave him a hard time. And, and again, I may repeat myself in this, but the, the government was 
a bunch of erudite individuals, astronomers, that thought uh, education was best, and, and that's why they poo-pooed him. They thought the the uh, sol the solving of longitude was going to be with the stars. So John Harrison was a pioneer in the field of precision clock making, but he was by no means the first to make mechanical clocks. By the time he was starting his first piece, mechanical clocks had been around for over 400 years. There is evidence that clockwork was being made in the late 13th century in Europe. And by no means is that clock a sophisticated clock, just a, something reminiscent. The first examples appear to have been large mechanisms made in monasteries as a means of automatically sounding bells for prayers. These were made without dials, so they sounded at the time rather than showing it. So the first one's yes. By the beginning of the 14th century, clocks with dials to show the time began to appear in communities across Central Europe as a convenient alternative to the sundial. And at that point, 14th, 15th century, even the poor people would have a very small pocket sundial. They could get in with two or three hours of what time it was in the day. Pretty amazing stuff. Kids, you know, like kids with the iPhone, they put a little sundial out there and they would know where they, what time it was roughly. <laughs> But these were not especially useful in cloudy weather, but particularly uh, during the night, they kept, they kept no time at all. So these were of relatively crude construction, all most made entirely of iron and wood powered by a weight. So these early machines were, however, very poor timekeepers. So at the end of the day, they may be out as much as a half hour to four hours a day for 24 hours. And this was all in the first 350 years of clock work. So 15 minutes to four hours a day per day off, first 350 years of clocks. So at that point, a sundial would have been much more accurate than an early clock. At the time, this did not matter much as there was usually only one clock in any town and uh, right or wrong, everyone agreed that uh, what really what time it was, that's all we need to know. So by the late 14th century, Smaller versions of these mechanical clocks we're talking about appear to be made for domestic use. Some were, as, uh, some were used as alarm clocks only running overnight, and some <laughs> just keeping the strike of the day. Then somewhere around 1450, there appeared the concept of a coiled spring. So again, up to now, we only have weights. So the coiled spring, instead of a weight hanging on a cord for driving power of a clock. For the first time, clocks didn't need to be fixed high upon a wall, or like our tall clocks here, they could be carried about wherever you went. By 1500, during the early Renaissance, cities in southern Germany, such as Nuremberg and Augsburg, had established themselves as world-renowned centers for fine metalwork. And it was here where the clock began to be made so small that it could be carried on the person itself. Finally, watches have arrived. Although very expensive to produce, these fine articles of jewelry still kept time no better than before, but it was portable. So they chiefly brought, were bought by the wealthy as tokens of prosperity. All this was to change in the following century as Europe saw an increasingly <laughs> rational and free-thinking view of science, the age of enlightenment. So throughout the second half of the 17th century, England too enjoyed the scientific golden age, the age of enlightenment, under King Charles II, under his patronage. The Royal Society was finally founded, and in 1660, with his funding, the Royal Observatory was built in Greenwich in 1675. Inspired by the celebrated astronomer Galileo, the brilliant realization that a swinging pendulum made a highly accurate keeper. So it was Galileo, while in Italy, he saw a, a chandelier supposedly going back and forth, and uh, he felt that that could make a good timekeeper, but no one picked up on it for many, many years, until a Dutch scientist, Christian Huygens, designed the first practical long pendulum, meter pendulum, or as the king put it, a, uh, a royal pendulum in 1656. Timekeeping changed overnight we were down to accuracy within minutes a day. So whilst the timekeeping of these earlier clocks had been in error of the 15 to 30, and now 
we have a real accurate timekeeper for the first time. So the introduction of the pendulum to clockwork was the greatest improvement ever in the history of timekeeping. The reason the pendulum is such a good timekeeper is unlike the controllers of earlier clocks, the pendulum has a natural restoring force, gravity, which ensures return as it swings and develops its own rate. So if you can envision the, the grandfather clock or tall clock behind me, as that pendulum goes back and forth, the weight is causing that pendulum to move, one of the weights, either strike or time side. So what happens is the weight swinging up, gravity forces it down, pushes it back, swings up this side. So it's a perfect rhythm. It couldn't be better. It was meant to be. So by the end of the 17th century, London was universally recognized as the world's most important center for the manufacture of clocks and watches. So only one real challenge remained, the challenge of developing a, a clock to run at sea or a watch for longitude. I'm sorry. So sorry. As a time span. No, that's good. So the longitude problem. So from the end of the 15th century, merchants, as we previously explained, explorers and adventurers, took to the open seas in unprecedented numbers. These journeys were hazardous, not only because of the inherent dangers of the sea, but also because once out of sight of land, sailors had no accurate means of knowing their exact position. One's position on Earth is defined by two coordinates. Latitude is one's distance north and south, south of the equator, and longitude, one's distance east and west from an agreed place, such as one's own port. In other words, how far around the world is one from your home? Latitude was easy to find with a little calculation by observation of the sun at midday or a pole star at night. However, longitude has always been a major problem. So to find your longitude at sea, you need to know at that moment, that precise moment, what time it is at some other known location on Earth, usually your home or your home port. Then by noting your local time, the difference between the two times provides you with the long longitude from your home. But the real problem here is to discover what time is at your home port. The obvious answer would be to take a portable clock and take it on the boat and, and read the time. But such a clock was never uh, allowed to operate properly because it couldn't be, it was affected by the violent movements of a ship and in addition to temperature changes. So the first marine chronometer tended to solve the violent hues and wet backs and forests of the ship moving, but not necessarily the temperature compensation. That came a bit later. In 1700, almost no one believed that such a clock could ever be made. The aristocracy and the astronomers were still thinking the answer was in the stars. So one alternative to the clock was to use the movement of the moon in the sky as a kind of clock to provide home time. This was called the lunar distance method. And most people believed it would solve the problem of longitude. The Royal Observatory was founded, as we said, in 1675 in Greenwich for the express navigational purposes of making charts of the skies, basically to appease the astronomers. Meanwhile, Seafaring nations continued to sail the oceans in spite of the longitude problem, and many lives and huge quantities of cargo were still being lost every year. So it was early 16, uh, 1567, the Spanish crown had offered a monetary award for the solution of the problem. Pressure was mounting of thousands of families who were affected by the loss of loved ones crashing on the rocks. The following year, the British government responded by passing an act of parliament um, and this was to give up to 20,000 pounds for anyone who could solve the problem in any way, shape, or form. So uh, as long as it could be practical, that's the key here, so the word practical. So if it's practical, it's not a one-time solution for one ship, one boat, one sailing vessel. It has to be, repeatability has to be made because at that point the British, um, the merchants of the British Empire had about 10,000 ships. We wouldn't call them ships today, but still. So this, whatever the solution was, it had to be quite repeatable over and over again. So what it brought out was, um, 
as we saw in the last slide, a lot of crazy quacks, and they, they were called the longitude lunatics. So everybody for 20,000 pounds would come up for anything. They could, you know, they could throw uh, coins up in the air and, and, and figure the problem out. So, so someone had to contend with this. The, uh, you know, at the Royal Observatory, these people went in and they, they, they pleaded their case, how they could solve the problem, but it just never, uh, never seemed to cut the mustard. So the unfortunate result of the act was that such an offer and a huge sum of money did attract a number of quacks and charlatans. A board of longitude was made up of senior politicians, high-ranking Navy personnel, and Oxford professors. They were flooded with weird and wonderful solutions and quite interesting suggestions. So John Harrison was a joiner. He was a woodworker. He was a, a, a furniture maker, a, a house builder from Lancashire. So one of a relatively humble background with little formal education. He took on the scientific and academic establishment of the day and by a sheer determination, coupled with an extraordinarily innate technical insight, finally succeeded in winning the Longitude Prize and gained wide world acclaim. But the interesting thing is, in his early five or six years, one interesting thing is, we don't know how he heard about this prize. Now he's sitting in the middle of England and this is happening in Greenwich on the Thames. And how did, how did this word get back that, hey, there's this contest going on and, and you, you, gotta, you gotta get involved? We don't know, he's, he's a woodworker, so uh, those first five years, um, when I transitioned about 25 years ago into clocks, I was a furniture maker and I couldn't imagine doing clocks back then. So it took a time period to transition. He had to continue making furniture to feed his family, uh, to whatever bills you have, you did a lot of bartering back then. But uh, nevertheless, he had to continue making furniture in the day and then experimenting with how to make a clock at night. So uh, very difficult times. And with no one around him, supposedly um, in quite a distance to ask, uh, how do you cut a gear? How, how does anyone cut a metal gear, a brass gear on a clock? So there was no one to ask about. Excuse me. So Harrison was born on the 24th of March, 1693, in Yorkshire. Harrison grew up in a remote village of Barrow, and we said on the Humber River. And little is known of his education, but he was probably educated at home, and his woodworking was uh, taught to him by his father. So his grandfather was a furniture maker, and he was a furniture maker, and he continued on. But perhaps this lore of 20,000 pounds, $4 million, Inconceivable, what would you even do with it? You don't spend really any money anyway where he is. Um, maybe that drove him. So where Harrison's interest in clock making came from is simply not known, but we do know that in 1713, at the age of 20, all of a sudden we find out that he completed the first long case clock like we have here. With relatively, um, a relatively ordinary case, and I'm referring to one of our clocks here, we're going to get to one of his clocks. And so this is a, a very, um, it could be the clock here, but it, it's encased and it's out of wood. And that's the interesting thing. So the dial is out of brass, but all the gearing, everything is out of wood. So was that intentional? He didn't have access. He didn't know how to heat brass. He didn't know how to make brass. Um, maybe he went to London. He brought, bought the dial on the front and the spandles in the corner and just accented his movement. So if someone, as a joiner, this is a logical move. If you say, hey, I want to learn how to make clocks, you make them out of wood because, again, the metal's not around. But in England, there is not anyone known, or the colonies, or even France, anyone known to have been doing this. So I, I just want to interject quickly here what was happening. It's not just England. It's the two superpowers in the world. It's England and France. They're the ones that are having the problem getting around the ocean. You know, getting down to the West Indies, getting their slaves back. They hit the rocks, the slaves die, the gold sinks. Um, so they're not just doing it for themselves, but they're in competition. Whoever rules the seas, rules the world. And, and there was an equal amount of two or three individuals in France that were working on this problem, the clock makers. Breton was the number one man. Um, he has phenomenal machines, phenomenal clock mechanisms, navigational mechanisms he was making simultaneously with Harrison. He tended to bail on the end, and he tried to buy Harrison out, and we'll get back to that. So three of Harrison's early wooden clocks have survived. So he made the first one. This is the first one. And he made three of them. 
The first with the movement signed at the date 1713, the second uh, a similar clock dated 1715, and that's at the Science Museum in London, and the third dating 1720 in a private collection. Uh, the early clocks were constructed of oak, so the superstructure which, would, which had been done out of brass was done out of oak. These all had conventional anchor escapements and count wheel systems for the striking of the hours. And this was standard for all long case clocks at the time. So you could put a long case clock next to Harrison's clock, and uh, it would be identical, except it was in wood. The mechanism was in wood. So having said this, all respects the clocks are, were all basically the same, just different versions of materials or fabric. In 1718, John had married, but tragically his wife Elizabeth had died just eight years later. Within six months, Harrison had married again, and he found another Elizabeth, so it made it easy to call around the house for his wife. <laughs> During the latter part of his career as a clockmaker, John and his younger brother James aided in the workshop. So when they were making furniture as a family still, James, his brother, was helping him, and he actually went to London to do the final, uh, he worked with him for several years in London to develop the clock. So while they were still in, uh, in Barrow and the Humber, um, and we're going to go to his clock here. This is, this is the Harrison clock, uh, the first tall case clock. All the, the gilt around the, uh, the chapter ring, that's all painted on in gold. That's gold powders that he mixed up. So all the decoration is in gold. And uh, he has an equ equation of time chart on the center of the, uh, the, of the door. Um, beautiful clocks. I've been around all three of his clocks. And uh, the one clock is resting with uh, someone I know in, in the Isle of Jersey right now. And it's in his private collection. So the Harrison brothers, while they're still on the Humber, their first commission, so they need to be recognized, they need money, and this came their way. So they, they first project, their first commission, was at Brocklesby Park. Um, it was a, a, a very rich aristocrat, and he has this huge stable. And he wants a clock on the front of the stable. He wants to make a statement, a big statement in 1720. So he commissioned the Harrison brothers to make a turret clock. Um, the clock, which was constructed almost entirely of oak, was quite revolutionary because it needed no lubrication. Even modern clocks use oils, and they all dry up, as we've maybe spoken before. All these oils, whether it was whale oil in the 18th, 19th century, or high-tech synthetic oils, they tend to all dry up in about five years. So most oils back then, though, were derived from the different um, type of animals, fats. So with no formal education, Harrison's was always a radical thinker. So in trying to, he ran into a problem because the clock stopped working. So instead of, after five years of being in, in the stable, instead of worrying about you know, what other kind of oil I'm going to use, he uh, found a way to improve the clock design and not the oil. So what did he use? He used um, boxwood for the bushings, and he used for any parts that are having a contact, a brush contact with each other, lignum vitae. So lignum vitae is known as ironwood in some circles, one of the hardest woods on the earth, and it's naturally oily, quite self-lubricating. So the clock originally had an anchor escapement, um, but it was failing, not keeping good time. Uh, and also because of its all wooden makeup. But Harrison soon improved this with a new invention. So the first in horological cir circles. So you can imagine this country bumpkin from Barrow um, beating the big names of Thomas Tompkins, George Graham, and, and the Nib family. And he ends up um, creating an innovation um, that would actually supersede the great horological minds of the day. I mean, it's, it's almost inconceivable. It's just, where did it come out of midair? Who knows? Nobody knows. So. So again, this grasshopper escapement um, was a sliding example. So an escapement, and we don't have a photograph of that, an escape wheel is a wheel with teeth. If you can picture your thumb and index finger sticking it every second on a tooth, the grasshopper escape flung itself off of each tooth to the next tooth. So there's very little to no brushing or uh, rushing, uh, brushing or brushing type contact. So now this clock has been in that stable we just saw for over 302 years. And it continues to run reliably and keeps excellent time today. It's, it's timing in probably within a minute to a minute and a half a month in that stable. 
And imagine the dirt. There's vents in that stable, the dirt. But keep in mind, it's, it's hand wound like the, the clock you have here in town. And uh, it's clean. I'm sure people look after it to the nth degree uh, because they know who made it. So the precision pendulum clocks flourished with the success of Brocklesby Park for Harrison. Harrison continued to develop more accurate and reliable clock designs. Next, he sat out on developing pre precision tall case clocks using the same materials and wheel work as his turret clock. The three clocks that he has made, dated 1726, 27, and 28, continue to run today, or is accurate to win the second a month. Can you believe that? The first, uh, number, number th uh, four, five, and six of his tall clocks run within a second a month, 330, 40 years, uh, respectively, at each clock. It's absolutely amazing. You can't get the best clocks by Thomas Tompkins, George Graham, and the Nip family, Dan Quare. You can't get that accuracy in them. It's absolutely amazing. So, and he, he is in the Guinness Book of World Records with a couple of these clocks. Not that he was trying to, because it didn't exist. But, <laughs> yeah. Clocks go further. <laughs> I mean, we're, 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 at, we're at a point of today that everybody has to have the, the newest, the, the, the craziest lights on the front of the car, the biggest, the best, the this, the that. You know, so it's, uh, but none of this was intentional. This, this stuff just happened. So, so then we get into temperature compensation. So that fame led him into speaking with George Graham and, and uh, working on this chronometer. So clocks go slower when they get warmer because the pendulum rod expands and lengthens. And longer pendulums beat more slowly than shorter ones. So for a clock to keep time consistently, the pendulum's effective length must not change at all. Harrison solved the problem of temperature change by inventing a pendulum which he, ins <laughs> instead of a simple rod, used a gridiron type pattern. And he made it by using an alternating series of brass and steel rods. So when, when the temperature changed, the brass would expand one way, the steel would go another. So they'd, they'd cancel out each other. So there was, there was no, no positive acts of expansion one way or another. Everything was static, and that was for good timekeeping. So in this brilliantly clever design, although all the rods are ever expanding, the effective length of the pendulum is the same and continues to keep time. So as a result, Harrison tells us that these early precision pendulum clocks achieved astonishing accuracy of a variation of no more than one second a month. A performance far exceeding the best London clocks of today and today. So there's a lot of individuals building clocks, copies of, those makers that I went through, those four or five makers, and I think they get a kick out of it, so they're not out trying to restore and uh, preserve clocks like I and some of my contemporaries do. They, they, want, they get kicks out of taking, say, a Harrison clock and, and reproducing it. Those clocks that they're making, they still have a hard time getting that one second a month accuracy. So a simple calculation based on the terms of longitude tells us that in order to qualify, for the main longitude prize of 20,000 pounds, a timekeeper would have to keep time with a variation of no more than 2.8 seconds a day. So you can imagine, you're on a sailing ship that's going up and down, the wind and, and different temperatures, the sun beats down, it gets cool at night, all this stuff happening. It cannot exceed, you cannot lose in that clock 2.8 seconds a day, the clock that you're, a pendulum clock or a clock that's in a watch form. So this is the first H1, they called it Harrison 1. He did H1, 2, 3, and 4. And um, the two balls at the top are the pendulums. But he designed this to be really stable in two axes. And that third axis really threw this off. And he would lose a lot of time. So imagine he had years and years in this design alone. So this man started when he was uh, around 20 years old, 21 years old. And in the end, I'll probably repeat this. But Harrison put 60 years of his life into solving the problem of longitude. Um, and it, it's pro it, it, it changed the entire world seemingly overnight. So Harrison realized to solve the problem, he needed to create a portable version of his pendulum clock. So this is kind of portable, but not really. It's huge. I mean, it's, it's you know, 36 inches by 18, 20 inches high by 12 inches deep. So, it is portable, but it takes like four or five people. It's gimbaled into a, a joiner's made case to get it on a boat. It was a big thing. So remember, we said that the problem of longitude or longitude was a, 
practical solution. So this was not a practical solution, nor did it work well, and he acknowledged that right off the bat. So in the following years, Harrison therefore formulated a plan for a large marine timekeeper. And it is recorded that some years later, after Harrison's death, that he visited London in about 1727 to seek help to make it. He came to London with preliminary sketches and manuscripts, showing them to the astronomer Royal. So he developed this in Barrow, takes it into a small boat on the river, and he, you know, the wind's blowing, and he can't keep it accurate. So he has no one else around him, apparently a good horological mind that can help him or even have a colloquy about. So he heads to London. So in Clerkenwell in London from about 1700 was the center of all clock and watchmaking. All the big names live in that area of London. So he goes to the uh, Royal Observatory. He's looking for somebody. So Harrison goes and he talks to uh, the Royal Astronomer, Halley. And uh, Halley said, I can't help you. I'm going to send you to George Graham. George Graham was the most important clockmaker in, in, uh, in the world at that point. He was the understudy of Thomas Tompion. And uh, just as a side note, the British government thought George Graham and Thomas Tompion were the two most important people ever in the history of the world. They buried them together in the floor in Westminster Abbey. So Tompion was the master. Graham was the understudy. He was the apprentice. So 45 years later, they, they opened the coffin up and they put him right in the box <laughs> with Tompion. And it's listed right there. It's the most, it's, it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. But they, they changed the world to such a degree. Yeah. Um, so it may be noted that after meeting Harrison, uh, <coughs> Harrison Haley put the word out. So Harrison left the Royal Observatory and, and talked to the Royal Astronomer. And he quickly put the word out around, uh, around London that this, this fellow from Barrow came up and he may be causing some problems because he's really uned he's an uneducated bumpkin, as, as the Royal Astronomer put it. But they felt threatened. He may have something on them, possibly. So Harrison, after arriving at to see George Graham at the recommendation of Haley, at around 10 a.m. in his workshop, would still be discuss discussing the timekeeper design of the potentiality of a chronometer. And they weren't calling it a chronometer at that time. It was uh, something to measure longitude, to determine longitude. So, and they actually talked late into the evening, possibly 12, 1 o'clock. So, to put it mildly, they could have felt a lot of competition with each other. The country bumpkin coming <coughs> to the master, but Graham embraced him, and he thought he loved his tenacity, and he gave him, uh, I don't know, about 20,000 pounds, because Harrison said, I don't have any money to live, and I can't keep building furniture to try and make a clock move. And so, Graham gave him 20,000 pounds to, uh, to get motivated and get started. So Harrison returned to his home in Barrow after he had the money and spent another five years. So this is not like I'm going home to, to kind of fix the problem. I mean, this was year after year, 60 years of one problem. He wasn't fixing clocks for anyone else or doing anything like that. Uh, can you imagine the frustration points and lack of tools? We have lack of electricity. We don't have heat in the room. We have zero magnification. So. I mean, these are huge obstacles to overcome. So in 1735, the Royal Society granted a sea trial for this new timekeeper. And so each one and Harrison sailed on the same warship, the Centurion, to Lisbon in May of 1736. After the voyage, the ship's log reveals each one did not perform quite as well as it should. On June 30th, uh, 1737, the Board of Longitude convened officially for the first time to hear how H1 trial went. Overall, H1 did not perform nearly well enough to win even the smallest of any longitude prizes. So, wishing to move on to a new design, Harrison didn't ask for a second trial, because trials took time. It had to be the right time of year, it had to be with a, a, a captain of a ship that would let you come on. Uh, so there were a lot of issues with that but he requested more financial assistance from the board to make an improved version. And as you can imagine, the board, a bunch of astronomers and politicians don't want, doesn't want to give them any money. So you figure it out, dude, and, and then come back to us when it's all good and we'll pay you. At least they thought it, they, you know, you would think that they would pay him. But although nothing like H1 had ever been seen before anywhere in the world, and the commissioners were undoubtedly very impressed by the machine and its inventor, even though they looked down upon him to a certain degree. So here's the second timekeeper. Um, we can see that uh, it's squarish, it's you know, a totally different design, and it, it virtually never made it to trial phase. 
So after all these years, 20 years of making the H1, he comes up with this and it really doesn't solve the problems. He comes up with H3, it's, it's basically a hybrid of the first two. Um, still not cutting it. So on his visit to London, especially once he'd been introduced to George Graham's circle, Harrison discovers the city's unique horological facilities and connections that may make his work easier. And I just talked about Clerkenwell. So all the big horological names working for the aristocracy uh, are in Clerkenwell, parts people. England developed the cottage industry of making parts for clocks. So Harrison didn't have to labor to find it, you know, a, a two inch diameter gear with 60 teeth. He could just go down the street. And he had people that were waiting in their, in their studios, their workshops to subcontract. And one was at John Jeffries, which is coming up. So it had almost anything he needed in the way of horological services or materials that could be sourced anywhere in the world, right there in London within four or five square blocks. Harrison now decided that if he were to succeed in creating a portable timekeeper, he would need the support of the London trade and a smart move. And he moved to London in 1736, soon after his return from Lisbon, and partially with George Graham's money. So this was a, was a big help. He moved into a townhouse in Red Lion Square, and that's eventually where he passed away. There he would remain for the rest of his life with his wife. He turned half the dwelling into his workshop and the other half where he and his life, wife lived. But in actual fact, he and his wife lived in basically one room. They cooked, they slept, they did everything in the one room. He took 75 to 80% of the house and that was workshops, so every man's dream. <laughs> So by January 1741, he was in front of the board again. But he'd already realized the deficiency of his new design and began to work on the third timekeeper. And we can go back, what you saw, it was a squarish one, H3. So H1 and H2 were cased at this point, mounted in large gimbals and just stored away horizontal for prosperity's sake. They were done. And thank God we still have them. But how Harrison realized the deficiency of H2 was a lack of balance. So everything was balanced between those two balls, whether the balls were between the movement plates or the first H1 on the outside. So they could not properly correspond to the centrifugal force of the ship, the third axis of forces that it was encountering. That was the whole ball of wax right there. So Harrison was obligated to continue and make changes to it. I mean, it was personal for him. This was, a, I, I think at times he was doing this just not for the money that he was doing this you know, to prove that, that a country carpenter could, you know, change his, his, uh, his field of expertise and get into this. So during this time period, Harrison won small awards for his efforts, totaling some 3,000 pounds, but that was barely enough for him to live. In 1749, he won the prestigious Copley Medal for his research work. This was a medal given, if you don't know, to all of the great scientific research of the day. Not every year the Copley Medal came out, if the British government felt that there wasn't anything of scientific merit, they didn't give it. Sometimes four, eight, ten years, there was no copy medal. But Harrison, the country bumpkin, received the medal. And he, he actually didn't recognize the, the, uh, the expanse of this, this uh, congratulate. Many astronomer, uh, astronomer members of the board took offense to Harrison receiving the medal for a country carpenter receiving such a high status. H3 itself was supposed to be Harrison's magnum opus but must have been Harrison's greatest technological disappointment of his life. So, some other, uh, other works of Harrison, some other things he's doing. So, I mean, he's got to kill some time. In London, I mean, what's, what's he doing for fun? He doesn't do a lot of things for fun. I mean, he's, he's a man obsessed, he's focused, he's lazy, he's monopic. So, but we know a little, very little bit about these other activities. Um, other than his timekeeper. So on the side, he continued, he continued to tune musical uh, movements and bells in the shop. And back in Barrow, when he was 11, 12, 13 years old, he would go around to all the churches in the subsequent communities and tune their bells and their musical instruments. And maybe that's kind of how he got into more of the clock thinking, uh, but who knows. And occasionally he took on some private horological restorations and conservations in the day just to pay the bills. So he was barely getting by. So it's one thing to have somebody put a lap of money in front of you and say, here, just take your time, think about the problem, solve it, and do it. It's another thing to be pressured 
I have to eat tonight, my wife, my wife, my kids, my dog, my cats. So among a, a small number of, uh, <coughs> among the small number of horologists and scientists who still believe a marine timekeeper is a possibility, very few had seriously contemplated the idea that something on the scale of a pocket watch, as opposed to a large clock, could ever be viable. After all, everyone knew what poor timekeepers' watches were. So since the Royal Pendulum came in in, in 1656 um, by Huygens, um, so again, we have tall case clocks like we have here down to eh, maybe one, two, three minutes a week. But watches are still way out, 15 minutes, three hours. So, so there, he would have been laughed out of the room. But secretly, Harrison had worked working on this for eight, maybe eight to 10 years behind the scenes, had been working on the watch, H4. So he abandons the clocks, he's been making a watch, and he gets this idea of a, of a spring escape and going back around, just like our standard pocket watches today or the standard wrist watches. Um, so during this time, he, as I said, in Clerkenwell, London, in a strip of four or five blocks, there were subcontractors. So Harrison could walk into a shop and say, uh, Hey, Bill, I want you to, to make a watch case or make five different gears. So Harrison did all the drawings. And he goes into a, a, one of these subcontractors, and his name is John Jeffries, and uh, a very well-known uh, parts type maker for clock makers in 1751. And he commissioned him to, uh, to make a watch of Harrison's own design. The watch which Harrison would have finished and adjusted himself. So he did the components. So all the components would come sitting on a table and Harrison would, would tweak them multiple times, hundreds and thousands of hours, and put them together and adjust them and synchronize them as, as he thought needed. So it, may be, uh, it might have been useful for his astronomical observation and clock testing, but was undoubtedly intended as a potential marine timekeeper. So he kept it well under, under secret that, because I'm sure everyone knew as, as a maker of parts, well, Harrison, Bill, Greg, they're all working on this. What do you think it is? So Harrison kept it secret what he was working on, not extrapolating that he was working on a watch that uh, was going to be the next possible solution to longitude. So what he did was we looked at, we looked at the, um, the compensated metal pendulum with a gridiron. We just looked at that for tall clocks. So that comes back into play. So Har Harrison gets the parts from John Jeffries, the, the great piecemeal clockmaker, and Harrison uh, takes the watch and gives it a bimetal spring. So he gets, on a microscopic level, he gets two different metals, he gets nickel and he gets brass, and he pounds them into a strip, and he somehow amalgamates them together, and then he makes the spring, and that's the secret for temperature compensation. So he did it, high, suc high success for the tall clocks, one second a month, still 320 years later with some of them. So this is what he did, bimetal spring. But it had another great feature, much more significant for timekeeping proper. Up until the 1750s, watchmakers had always made the balance of their, their watches relatively small. So you, as a watchmaker, you wanted the watch to operate on as little power as you can. So he <coughs> felt with all this well, centrifugal type forces, the ship is being tossed in three axes, that he needed to make a, a larger balance and a, a more weighted balance. So they oscillated with very low frequency, traditional watches made in the day, pocket watches. Harrison departed from the traditional watchmakers thinking, postulating a balance must oscillate with as much stored energy as possible. But to achieve this, this meant going completely against the cardinal rule of the watchmaker's book. The balance he designed from the Jeffrey's watch was very, very heavy almost 10 times heavier than a standard watch. He gave it a rim of gold instead of brass. So it beaded much faster than normal watches and was somewhat larger than usual. It was beating every half second than every second. The watch had a verge escapement when it was completely redesigned, enabling the balance to run at a much larger amplitude. From these modifications, he began to realize the way and he, he ran forward into success. Not surprisingly, in most respects, this is a large silver cased watch um, that Harrison had made. <coughs> it was just 13 uh, centimeters, centimeters in diameter. It's completely different from the earlier timekeepers. 
both externally and to some extent internally. H4 looks like a very large contemporary pocket watch. Uh, we can't go back to one, can we, Steve, or no? To, to, to one? To one, that'd be too difficult. Yeah. Yeah, okay, that's fine, that's fine. So it looks like a large pocket watch we saw on the first slide, okay? And it looks no different than anything anyone was carrying, except it's 13 centimeters, it's like this. It looks like a, a pocket watch for some Brobden Nagian in, in a fairy tale or something. So Har Harrison uh, used internally jeweled bearings of diamonds. So in 1760, and what was generally used back then was actually bronze, was used for bearings, and they were just getting, on the verge of getting into rubies and some other jewels, but Harrison is using diamonds for bushings. So just imagine the lack of technology to drill the diamond out to receive the arbor or the shaft or the, the axle, as we would call it, a common person would call it. I mean, it's inconceivable. It's inconceivable. Um, so in 1760, Harrison was awarded um, by the Longitude Board a trial for H4 to the West Indies. H4, the pocket watch, the big pocket watch. Coming back from the West Indies, the watch proved to be only, this is amazing, one minute and 54 seconds off of the total. So 147 days at sea, rough sea, storm, calm seas, huge heat, cool nights. One minute and 54 seconds from leaving London and coming back to Portugal. How crazy is that? I mean, it's, it's inconceivable. I, I'm not sure a quartz watch could do that today. No, it could, but it, it, it's absolutely crazy. So therefore, the calculations for the return of longitude only to have an error of 5.1 seconds during this whole voyage. Needless to say, Harrison and the board were very pleased. On the board, there were many naysayers to believe that a country carpenter of hum humble, untrained qualifications could be superseded by trained astronomers of the day to solve the problem of longitude. The board continued, even with Harrison's success, trying to delay him the full prize for his trials and tribulations. So they strung this out for about 12 years. They didn't want to pay him. They owed him probably 12,000 pounds equivalent of, I don't know, $2.7 million. And they just didn't want to pay him. They have, they have it right in their hand. They can take the, this, this ring chronometer. They can give it to one of the top five clockmakers in London and tell them to reproduce it and they have a practicable solution to longitude. And if they can somehow get rid of Harrison, they can save themselves a lot of money and put it in their own pot, pot, political pockets, right? Um, nothing we would do today though, we, we wouldn't do that today. <laughs> I'm sure that it was a short lived back then. So it took the interruption of the process by King George III himself to force the board's hand in awarding Harrison the prize. King George, uh, a lot written about him, a little bit crazy, but he loved astronomy, he loved horology, he loved scientific instruments. So he sought out Harrison, he heard about Harrison's plight, he couldn't pay his rent uh, at, at Red Square there. So he, he actually sought him out and uh, brought him over and they talked and because the king went and demanded that Harrison be paid his, his due, um, that's, what, that's how he got paid finally in the end. So. Um, but keep in mind this whole process, the French, the French are simultaneously building the same kind, similar type of movements as Harrison Breton. Similar movements the whole time, over 40, 50 years. But in France, it was four different um, horologists or scientists were doing this. Harrison was like a one-man show that ran with this for 60 years. But the French, like the British, would set out the benefit from the successful solution of the problem. Um, so his name was Ferdinand Breton. On two clandestine occasions, Breton traveled to meet Harrison in private. So one was unannounced and one was announced. So the Frenchman can't come up with a solution. He doesn't have the backing that the English are putting into Harrison. He, is, he doesn't have the big prize. But he knows if he gets the solution, he's going to reap a lot of benefit, a lot of monetary and a lot of egotistical boost out of this. Um, so he came to Harrison's place, Harrison's little studio there, and, you know, wrapping on the door a candlelight and, and he, he was going to, he offered him 10,000 pounds for this. Give me, give me your, give me your watch. So the board's not paying you, John. I'll pay you for it and we're all, it's all good. You know, you have money in your pocket and, and but, but Harrison wouldn't, uh, you know, he wouldn't, wouldn't bow into the French. He wouldn't bow into Breton and he wouldn't bow into Fr the, the, the French as his arch rival. Um, because if he knew if he did, he would have had a hard time getting that technology back. So, so he did. 
So he didn't, he didn't cave in, he remained steadfast, he didn't give any secrets away to the competitor or to, this, uh, to the uh, France. But in the very end, Harrison, he's 80 years old, uh, as a result of the decree of King, uh, King George III, Harrison was awarded the balance of his prize, finally. So after 12 years, imagine sleeping every night knowing that you, you did what you had to do, you stuck by it, it's a lifetime, it's 60 years, and they're not paying you. They're still not paying you. Um, and unfortunately, Harrison lived only two years after this to enjoy the fruits of his labor. So he had his money for two years, and that was it. So for almost 60 years, he dedicated his entire life to solving the horological enigma. And somehow, as history and other things get lost, and, and they do get lost, and we have, we're in a fast-paced world, and whether it's our age or younger people, um, the machines were the machines were lost, and they were put into the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, uh, disrepair. Some at some point, they were put on the uh, cement stone floors uh, in just deplorable condition, probably from the 1840s up until I believe you know the 1920s, 19 teens. And then a, uh, a fellow came, uh, it's a whole other story, but this fellow, Rupert uh, Gould, came by. Um, he had some psychological issues, he had anxiety issues. He was a cartographer in the British Navy, and he wanted something to do with his time. Mm -hmm. So he, he latched onto Harrison, he knew nothing about clocks. And he, he, he saw, supposedly the story is he saw a watch while he was in the mental hospital, and it fascinated him, and he started reading, and he read about Harrison, and he wanted to see the timekeepers. And he found that the timekeepers were in Greenwich that they were not taken care of. So he, he, he went to the board, uh, the board of the Navy, and they, they gave him access, and he started mm -hmm. to restore them. So here's a guy who never touched a clock. He starts to restore them, but he did it sympathetically. He didn't go over the edge. So we have to thank Rupert Gould for you know this talk today and, and letting us in on Harrison, because he did research back in the, the 19 teens uh, when research a lot more may have been still available uh, to tell us about Harrison's life and how the story had unfolded. And uh, so in the end, he restored one through four with virtually no experience at all. So the interesting dichotomy, dichotomy is, it's almost like Harrison himself. He's a guy that came up as a country carpenter, crude furniture maker, and he turns into this guy that can make a second month tall case clock accuracy within a second month. So it's almost like Rupert Gould comes in out of nowhere and he restores Harrison's mechanisms. So it's, 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 a, perfect, it's a perfect parallel. Um, and it's a great book. There's a book out there. It's an expensive book. There are limited copies, seven or $800 about Rupert Gould. But it talks all about John Harrison. So, uh, uh, so that's about it. So any quick questions? I don't know what time we have. I hope I made it in a reasonable time. After taking a, a bit of a long lunch there. So. <laughs> Any questions? The local time. So Greenwich time was obviously local noon, and that's their yeah. zero. He goes up to Lisbon, he comes back, he's off two minutes after a month and a half or whatever. Whatever it was, yeah. Whatever. Do they, do they redo their local time every day, or how do they, how do they maintain the, the mother clock at its time? Well, the mother, the mother clocks, there's, there's two mother clocks really in, in the Greenwich Observatory. And, you know, once once they're locked in, they're locked in. They have 20, two, two people 24 hours a day watching those clocks. The clocks never stop. So, and there, there's counter offenses by regulator clocks, too. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. But all that one minute and 54 seconds off in that voyage, that just was put into the longitude equation that he came up the English Channel didn't crash into the rocks, basically. So uh, that had nothing to do with changing time at the homeland or anything of that nature. Did they have to change the time at the homeland? No, no. That was? That's set. And my second question is, the Earth is 360 degrees. Yes. Why do we have a 24-hour clock? It's, uh, we can answer that, but it's, it's going to, if you want to answer that, we can have another seminar. <laughs> how, how, how time was put up into in sidereal time and various type of times I can bring a astronomical clock dial and I have one and we can we can go through some of those different things Thank you. equation of time so it's fascinating I know there's a lot of information otherwise I don't like to read it but uh, I didn't want to miss anything out I know the story way too well I've been to Greenwich I've I've been to Barrow where Harrison was 
Um, there's nothing there. There's nothing there. There's a parking lot and there's a building. They think it could have been his workshop. Huh. But I mean, just the essence to touch the wall, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's very humbling, you know. Um, but in Greenwich, uh, Haley, the Royal Observatory, or uh, astronomer, I'm sorry, Royal Astronomer there, this, this chap would live there 24 7. He was not allowed. And they had two huge telescopes, if anyone's been there. A wooden roof opens on both sides, and the telescopes can be hoisted up, like cranking the, the, the clock here, winding the weights up, and it would come out of the floor. And he had a jumpsuit, and, and I was over there, and they, somebody had found his jumpsuit and donated it back. And we had this unveiling of his jumpsuit. It's like a, it was like a pink, it's crazy, like a pink jumpsuit, but it was out of silk and insulated. It was a beautiful thing. But he wore that all the time, you know, during the, the off season, the winter season. Um, and I was also there at another time when H1 and H2 by Jonathan Betts, who was the, uh, you know, the Royal Astronomer at, the, at Greenwich, um, we disassembled those clocks. And I watched him disassemble and assemble them. He can't touch them, I can't touch them, he can. And a few other people could of, of high stature uh, in the British Horological Institute. So, so uh, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's the holy grail. One more question. Yeah. You got three ships leave right. Liverpool, and they all meet in Philadelphia two months later. Okay. And they all have the same clock, and they're off by 15 seconds. What happens then? Hmm. Um, I think if they meet, arrive safely, everybody's happy. Okay. No, 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 I'm not being serious. That's, that's all they were worried about was, uh, you know, landing, landing up the right uh, tributary or estuary or something. So they didn't worry about whether they're no, no, but I mean time, you know, and, and again that can be, we can talk about timekeeping that really came into its own in the 1850s, 1865, and that was AKA because of the railroads. So trains were literally crashing into each other. So that's a whole other world. And part of it was sponsored by this country, the government of this country in the 1870s. They, you know, they put big money up to Hamilton Watch, Co uh, Hamilton Watch Company in Lancaster, PA, to develop much better timekeepers. And imagine you'd have to have right, right. This was a station. You'd have to have a regulator here. You'd have to have accurate pocket watch to come here in the morning. And maybe there's four stations down the line, and you'd have runners on horses. They come and they have four pocket watches that were set to this regulator clock, and he would give them to each of the conductors going down to each of the stations. And this happened over the whole country. I mean, it's it's mind-boggling how this would have worked, but it saved a lot of death and destruction. And it was you know simultaneous again. We were doing it. They were doing it in Europe, but. Harrison, this is the this is the beginning of, of real time keeping here. So, what made him switch from brass to diamonds? Uh, because because obviously if this is the axle going through and you you put a diamond circle here and drill it out, I mean diamonds are so hard that it's just not going to wear. The brass the brass or bronze uh, <laughs> axle or pivot's going to wear out before the diamond. Yeah, I mean the, the bushings those bushings and those plates are always the weak spot. So, uh, and and I think you know. In addition to, and not, it, it is hard, but what it is, it didn't require any lubrication. So that watch, H4, required zero lubrication because of the diamonds in the bush areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the answer what his concern was on these different clocks, uh, I was in the Navy in the late 1960s, and we still used the mechanical chronometers, and with each chronometer, what was important was it was consistent. So if it was X number of seconds over a day or a week, uh, that was all ca calculated in the time you were looking at on the chronometer. So in other words, one chronometer you knew was two seconds, another chronometer four seconds. And so so each one had a little correction in my say. The, the, okay. problem, you know, the, pro the problem with right after, about 10 years after Harrison, you had four manufacturers of chronometers. And, and it, it was another problem evolving. There was no standard then. So, you know, you produce one, he produced one, I produced one. And I, I may have said mine's more accurate than yours. And maybe I'm cutting corners in mine, and I'm two minutes off, and you're only 15 seconds. So, yeah, there, was, there, was, there, there became issues. Yes, yes, I see what you're saying. So was the face of the clock time, or was the same face of the clock uh, latitude, longitude? Oh, just time. It's just a big watch. Just a big watch. Yeah. yeah. Why did they make the face longitude? Um, because there, were, maybe the calculation couldn't have been put into that, that watch at that time. I don't know.
I think they were lucky to do, do what they did. Okay, well, thanks everyone for coming out. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we've got some other events, uh, as I said, these little clips, and, and, and big surprise for those who know me that there's some chocolate on the way out. <laughs>